Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Today we start the next chapter which is on phase diagrams. First let us start by playing a video. In this video we will see that a dendritic solidification of an undercooled melt of stearic acid. So in this we see that there is a molten pool of stearic acid which is a low melting material and then let the video replay then I will show you some features of this. You see that there is a liquid melt in which there is a solid forming. This solid grows in the form of a dendrite. There is even a nucleation of a new crystal. We learn more about nucleation in the next uh, chapter and then there is this interdendritic liquid and finally when the dendrite spreads over uh, all the liquid turns into a solid. There might be a little uh, pool of liquid left between the dendrites which also solidifies in the end. Therefore, suppose I freeze or pause my video at any point of time, you see that there is a mixture of solid and liquid. That means the whole uh, pool is neither fully homogeneously liquid nor fully solid, but there is solid in some regions like shown here. In this region there is solid and regions between the solid. So, many such kind of solidification uh, microstructures we will be considering in this chapter. But suppose the final product I get this I can call a microstructure because there is certain feature there is certain morphology to the whole process which has taken place. So, we, should, we are in a good position after seeing this video of dendritic solidification of stearic acid from an undercooled melt. Uh, we will technically define what is meant by an undercooled melt when we talk about phase transformations, but for now we will consider that we are below the melting point of stearic acid and this whole solidification is taking place at a temperature. Uh, which is kept constant below the melting point of the steric acid. So, we start with a molten pool and this molten pool slowly solidifies. So, we are in a position to take up the chapter on phase diagrams. Phase diagrams are also called sometimes equilibrium phase diagrams. We will discuss this word equilibrium in the context of phase diagrams a little more in the coming slides, but when, whenever we use the word phase diagrams typically we mean equilibrium phase diagrams. In the context of this we will learn about something known as the phase rule. We will take up some typical phase diagrams and we will understand how to find out the fraction of the phases formed using the lever rule. There are many good textbooks in this area. There is even an ASM handbook uh, or an ASM book published by ASM in this area, but the book by Prince on alloy phase equilibria is a good classic text in this area. But most material science books or physical metallurgy books will definitely have a long chapter devoted to phase diagrams. First and foremost we should note that phase diagrams are an important tool in the armory of a material scientist. So, suppose there is a material scientist and he wants to understand phase uh, evolution behavior or and wants to understand how what phases exist for a given composition at a given temperature and pressure then he would rely on phase diagrams. There are extensive collection of binary and ternary phase diagrams in literature, there are dedicated uh, handbooks which deal with phase diagrams. The other important tool which will be the topic of the next uh, chapter is something known as the TTT diagrams or the time temperature transformation diagrams. Um, if you want to understand a phase diagram in the simplest sense we can think of it as a diagram which demarcates various regions of existence of various phases. That means it is something like a map which demarcates regions based on political, geographical or other criteria. For instance when you look at a map you know that there is uh, grasslands in some place, mountains in some place or you can say one country is in one place, another country is in a different place. Here this is a map which demarcates different phases uh, which exist. So, in some sense the broader sense phase diagrams are maps um, and we should note that material scientists will encounter many more maps like creep mechanism maps, um, material selection maps etcetera which form an important tool in the armory of a material scientist. And therefore, a thorough understanding of phase diagrams is a must for all material scientists. As I pointed out phase diagrams should also be called 
equilibrium phase diagrams and this uh, usage requires a special attention. This is because though we mean equilibrium in practical terms the equilibrium we are considering is not global equilibrium, but what we call as the microstructural level equilibrium. So, we have defined a very functional uh, definition of microstructure before as a combination of phases, defects, residual stress and the distributions and the equilibrium we typically talk about which is described in phase diagrams is not the global equilibrium, but what we call microstructural level equilibrium. Uh, we will consider some more aspects of this uh, in the coming slides, but one point I would like to mention for now that suppose I have a combination of two phases say phase A which I am marking in a whitish color and a phase B which is the intermediate phase. So, this is phase A and this is phase B. Now, obviously, if you have such a distribution of phases which constitutes my microstructure, then there are a lot of inter internal interfaces. So, there are these red lines are interfaces between phase A and phase B these interfaces obviously cost energy to the system and if you allow the system you expect that system to coarsen in other words you would expect this wavelength say for instance this wavelength a to increase and in the ultimate limit I would not like to have so many interfaces in the system and the global minimum if you obtain it you expect that the entire phase a would be present and I am drawing a schematic here. So, this is a schematic. So, this is again a very crude schematic. So, what I would expect is that the entire phase A will be on one side, the entire phase B will be on the other side, the entire phase A will be deemed uh, what you call bounded by a what you may call a wolf construction low energy surface. So, that the entire surface energy of this becomes minimum, you would also expect that the surface energy of this phase B is also low and additionally that the interface which is marked in the red color between A and B is also a low energy interface. But rarely we take a system from this configuration which is a microstructural level equilibrium to a global equilibrium. So, I can label this as a microstructural level equilibrium So, rarely we allow the system to go from this to this in other words whenever we are talking about phase diagrams we do tolerate micro constituents and micro structures and therefore, typically the phase diagrams we consider are not global equilibrium phase diagrams though we call them equilibrium phase diagrams they are more at the micro structure level equilibrium phase diagrams. And often you would note that micro structural information is overlaid on phase diagrams and an important point to note is that this is for convenience, this is for us to sort of extend the utility of phase diagrams and this microstructural information is not implied by the phase diagram. And this aspect that phase diagrams represent microstructure level equilibrium is often not stressed upon. So, this is a very important thing to note because often textbooks will start with the uh, assumption that uh, you understand the fact that this is our microstructure level equilibrium diagrams and there will be no further mention of the fact that these are uh, not truly a global representation of the truly global equilibrium and the additional fact that truly speaking you there is no information in the phase diagram regarding the uh, any microstructural information. This has been overlaid on the phase diagram to make it more useful to get additional information out of the phase diagram. Broadly two kinds of phase diagrams can be differentiated those involving time and those which do not involve time. Normally. Uh, those involving time like the time temperature transformation diagrams are not typically called as phase diagrams, but in the general sense in the from the point of view of convenience of understanding they can also be classified as phase diagrams. 
and uh, special care must be made whenever you are talking about a phase diagram involving time, because such a phase diagram has a directionality to it and therefore, uh, whenever you are trying to understand information from a, uh, a diagram involving time, you should be more careful than that which there is which is totally time independent. And in this chapter, we shall deal with phase diagrams not involving time and this can further be those which involve composition as a variable, like you can talk about temperature versus percentage of copper or a percentage of an alumina or percentage. So, it is a composition temperature phase diagram and those without composition as a variable that means, the variables are purely thermodynamic variables like pressure and temperature. The former one the one involving composition is what is called a typically a metallurgical or a materials phase diagram, which is you will encounter very frequently as a material scientist and uh, the later one is typically uh, taken up more by the physicist. The temperature composition diagrams uh, as I pointed out are extensively used by in material science and we will consider this in a lot of detail in this chapter. And we shall also restrict ourselves for now to structural phases, uh, like we will not consider phases based on physical property. Uh, like we had talked about before that phases can be defined based on a geometrical entity or a physical property. And therefore, we suppose you are talking about physical property, we may talking about for instance, a ferromagnetic phase or anti ferromagnetic phase. And if you are wanting to overlay additionally this physical information, then we will have to in include for instance, Curie temperatures need to be overlaid on a phase diagram. Uh, but in this chapter, we shall restrict ourselves to the definition of a phase based only on structure and not on physical property and therefore, typically you will find that I am not overlaying any Curie temperature or Neal temperature on a phase diagram. Time temperature transmission diagrams which will be the basic focus of uh, the next chapter and a close cousin of that which is the continuous cooling transmission diagrams, the both of them involve time. These diagrams are usually designed to have an overlay of microstructural information. So, the very starting objective of these kind of diagrams is to have microstructural information overlaid and we also want to understand microstructural evolution and this will be the topic of the next chapter on phase transformations. Now, uh, we have defined the term microstructure before and uh, it is worthwhile to revisit some of the concept, the concept of a phase, the concept of a microstructure and uh, what you call revise the concepts. So, we have seen that we can start from an atom and we can go to the structure and the structure can be based on crystal structure or as I pointed out on a physical property like an electromagnetic structure. Then we go to the next scale the scale of microstructure and finally, to the scale of the component. And if you look at a typical microstructure like the one shown in the diagram above the term microstructure, you see that there is a polycrystalline material that means, there are grain boundaries and in addition there are twin boundaries which you would observe in this microstructure. Now, in a typical microstructure some of the features may be revealed, revealed at the uh, level of the what you may call the metallography done or may not be revealed. Suppose, you are looking at a typical scanning electron micrograph or an optical micrograph then you would not observe dislocations. On the other hand in a typical micrograph you might observe grain boundaries like in the, if you look at the figure at the bottom you would notice that this is a sort of a three dimensional rendering done by taking progressive sections of a material and building up the images, you would notice that there are these grain boundaries and these grain boundaries are going downward into the material which are seen in the section. So, this concept of a microstructure will be the focus uh, of these two chapter on phase diagrams and the chapter on phase transformations. Now, to start with let us have some definitions in place and the first one is what is a component of a system. The component could be and this is a very important note elements and these elements for instance could be gold, copper, could be sodium etcetera. They could be ions like for instance in a ionic system you could be talking about ions components. They could even be compounds like for instance in the alumina chromia system which we will take up some time. The alumina and chromia both of which are compounds are components of the phase diagram. So, it is important to note that components need not only be elements. This is sometime not truly stressed upon, but it is important note and we will take up examples that actually components can be elements, ions or even compounds. And um, you could be drawing a phase diagram for instance, a unary phase diagram for water in which case the component is water which is a compound. 
So, to emphasize it is important note that components need not be just elements. Typically you would encounter the term phase in textbooks as defined to be something which is physically distinct, chemically homogeneous and mechanically separable region of a system like a gas phase, a crystalline phase and amorphous phase and this is the typical textbook definition. But uh, we will go ahead and use more definitions or more viewpoints to understand this concept of a phase a little better in the coming slide. Typically if you look at gases, then gases mix in all proportions. Suppose I take nitrogen and argon, I can take 1 percent of nitrogen with 19 percent of argon and mix it or I could take 19 percent of oxygen and mix it with 1 percent of hydrogen etcetera and therefore, mixing at an atomic level at an intimate level is complete in the gaseous state. Therefore, the gaseous state always forms a single phase. Therefore, we should note this in liquids you could have for instance, sodium chloride in water which is basically taking salt and dissolving it in water. This solution is a single phase solution, okay. but additionally you could also have cases where there are more than two phases for instance, oil in water and there is no mixing at the atomic level of oil in water and therefore, oil and water phases separate out and there is a distinct interface between the two phases. So, gases are always form a single phase, liquids uh, may mix like alcohol in water, liquids may dissolve solids and form a single phase or they could be separated out like in the case of oil and water. Solids on the other hand are more interesting and rich. In general due to several compositions and crystal structure many phases are possible and this is very very important to note that is for the same composition different crystal structures represent different phases. So, let me reiterate even though my composition which could be pure iron for instance in the example below if I change my crystal structure then they represent different phases like for instance iron BCC and iron FCC are different phases. Silicon um, in the diamond cubic form vis a vis silicon in the amorphous form represent different phases. Since we are talking about the amorphous form a point may be noted here that typically you would observe that we had defined phases based on atomic structure to be crystalline, quasi crystalline and amorphous. Typically in phase diagrams amorphous phases will not be found and the reason is that typically it is assumed that or it is found that for the at least there is one crystal structure for a given temperature and pressure which will have a lower Gibbs free energy and in other words is more stable than the amorphous phase and therefore, the amorphous phase does not represent equilibrium an equilibrium phase and therefore, they are typically not included in phase diagrams. Some quasi crystals are have been postulated to be equilibrium phases and those kind of quasi crystal may be included, but in typical phase diagrams you would only find crystalline phases and therefore, in this chapter we will only focus on crystalline phases in the phase diagrams. Therefore, as I was pointing out um, just to reiterate this uh, slide once more uh, this drawing here that we shall consider only crystalline phases as a part of the phase diagram though there is a possibility of even quasi crystalline phases. Uh, being stable or in other words e being equilibrium phases, amorphous phases definitely do not find a place in the phase diagram. Now, I pointed out that if you have silicon and you have silicon in two forms the amorphous form and the uh, crystalline form, then these represent two different phases. In other words different polymorphs of the same element different different represent different phases. Also for the same crystal structure different compositions different different phases. That means, suppose I have a gold copper alloy and gold and copper dissolve in each other in all proportions that means, it forms an isomorphous system as we shall see later. 70 percent gold 30 percent copper alloy which is say I call alloy 1 
and say this is alloy 2. Alloy 1 and alloy 2 represent different phases, though both of them have the same components gold and copper, both of them have the same crystal structure which is FCC, but the proportion of gold and copper is different in these two alloys and therefore, these represent different phases. Since now, we have a different phases either based on crystal structure or based on composition. Therefore, there is a rich variety of phases which are possible in the solid state and these phases needs to be differentiated. As I pointed out, we have a textbook definition of a phase which says that it is a physically distinct, chemically homogeneous and a mechanically separable region of a system uh, like for instance, a gas crystal or amorphous phases, but it is worthwhile to ask here what kind of phases exist and um, in what would be the basis of definition of these kind of uh, different kind of phases. So, here uh, we will list a few and it is worthwhile to note these because often when you read literature, when you read textbook, you may find usage of some of these terms. From school days, we know that based on state, we can define a phase to be a gaseous liquid or a solid phase. We already seen that based on atomic order, you can have amorphous, quasi crystalline and crystalline phases. We have also seen before that based on band structure, you could have insulating, semiconducting, semi metallic and metallic phases. For instance, often you may read literature wherein they talk about um, phase transformation from a metallic phase or a metal insulator transformation. So, that means they are talking about a metallic phase going to an insulator phase uh, and this kind of a phase transformation involves a change in the property and this property has been defined based on the band structure. Additionally, you could have uh, definitions of phase based on properties like people would refer to ferromagnetic phases, superconducting phases, paraelectric phases and often you will note terms like when you heat a ferromagnetic substance, it turns into a paramagnet. That means, a ferromagnetic to paramagnetic transformation can be considered as a phase transformation which has been defined based on property. Additionally, based on stability people also define phases like a stable phase, a metastable phase and when you are talking about equilibrium phase diagram, our focus will be on the stable phases, but sometimes the phase diagrams are extended to include metastable phases in the gambit of a phase diagram, but typically usually they are meant to include only stable phases. Sometimes you would also notice that people define phases based on size or geometry of the entity like a nano crystalline phase, a mesoporous phase in which case the pore size is between that in the nano crystalline and micro and nano regimes, people even talk about layered phases etcetera. So, to summarize this slide, typically we have a uh, sort of event called the official definition of a phase as seen here, but in diverse context we may come across terminology which define phases based either on the state like a solid liquid and a gas. There may be definitions based on atomic order like a quasi crystalline phase and within quasi crystals people may even talk about an icosahedral phase or a decagonal phase and then there is definitions based on the band structure like people may talk about a metallic phase or an insulating phase. You could talk about a property based definition of a phase like a ferromagnetic phase or a paramagnetic phase and you could talk about a stable phase and a metastable phase and I told you in this context that the stable phase is what you typically mark in a equilibrium phase diagram and additionally you may talk based on size or some geometry of the entity as nano crystalline, mesoporous, layered etcetera. So, we have been using a term called phase transformation so far and though it is obvious we will uh, consider a few examples. A phase transformation implies a change of phase from one phase to any other for instance water to ice which happens when you cool a system, a water system. You can talk about alpha ion BCC going to gamma ion when you heat this uh, alpha ion. Additionally, if you are talking about gamma ion at high temperatures which is cooled then you would observe a phase transformation in which you will obtain an alpha ion and a cementite. We will take up these some of these things in detail later, but it is important to note this gamma ion splitting into alpha ion and cementite on cooling involves a change in composition apart from a change in the phase because uh, the starting phase is gamma ion is FCC and the phases you obtain cementite is orthorhombic and ferrite is uh, BCC. You could heat a substance a ferromagnetic phase and produce a paramagnetic phase which is a phase transformation based on property. Another definition we need to consider now which we have talked about before and therefore, we just briefly consider it here that a grain is a single crystalline part of a polycrystalline material separated by a grain boundary. Additionally, we also 
will be talking about two important terms one is known as microstructure and other is the term called micro constituents. Though in textbooks microstructure is typically defined as entities seen at a high magnification of about 100 to 1000 times, uh, but here we have already made a functional definition based on distribution of phases, defects and residual stress. So, this is expected to be a functional definition because this directly gives a handle on the properties. So, we also defined a phase diagram to be a map demarcating regions of stability of various phases and uh, typical variables which you encounter or we may call the axis of a phase diagrams can be thermodynamic, kinetic or composition variables. And as I had pointed out typically that the metallurgist deal with those phase diagrams which involve thermodynamic and composition variables and typically metallurgists operate or material scientists would draw phase diagrams at one atmosphere pressure, but it is and typically do not draw diagrams which involve volume, but it is possible to draw those diagrams and physicists tend to draw diagrams which involve purely thermodynamic variables involving a typically a single component. Kinetic variables are typically not included in normal phase diagrams uh, as I pointed out they should be considered part of something known as time temperature transformation diagrams uh, which are also maps and which can also be considered as phase diagrams, but typically not included in normal chapters on phase diagrams. So, to summarize axis can be thermodynamic like temperature, pressure, volume, they can be kinetic like time, they can involve composition variables like percentage of an component or uh, this percentage could be in mole fraction, could be weight percent. In single component systems which are also called unary systems, the usual variables are temperature and pressure. So, you could also draw temperature volume diagrams, but the typical uh, variables chosen to plot such unitary diagrams are temperature pressure and we will see an example in one of the coming slides. And as I pointed out the diagrams phase diagrams drawn in material science temperature and percentage of one of the components which could be in usually in weight percent or atomic percent forms the other axis. So, um, whenever you are interested in kinetics only then we consider phase diagrams with time like the continuous cooling transformation or the TT diagram wherein temperature and time are the variables. So, it is important to understand the variables which are used in a phase diagram and these variables as we have classified here turn out to be thermodynamic, kinetic or composition variables. So, let us revise some of the points regarding the important points regarding phase diagrams and in addition we will add a few more points <coughs> which will strengthen our uh, understanding of these. So, it will set the base ready for the slides which are going to come next. Phase diagrams are also called equilibrium phase diagrams. Though the word equilibrium is not explicitly stated in this context it usually means microstructural level equilibrium and not global equilibrium. Microstructural level equilibrium implies microstructures are allowed to exist and the system is not in a state of global energy minimum. That means, suppose I take a microstructure I allow interfaces like in this diagram multiple interfaces, I may allow dislocations, I may allow residual stress to exist etcetera and uh, this implies that I am not truly considering a global energy minimum or a global energy minimum. This statement also implies that micro constituents can be included in phase diagrams and we will see what some examples of micro constituents in the coming slides. Additionally, certain phases and one good example of this is the cementite phase in the iron carbon diagram are also included in phase diagrams. If you want to be very strict you will note that cementite is not strictly an equilibrium phase. In other words cementite will decompose to graphite and ferrite given sufficient thermal activation and time. That means that cementite in the truest sense should not be included in a phase diagram. Uh, but you will notice that whenever we draw an iron carbon phase diagram, uh, cementite is included because uh, it is a reasonably metastable phase and continue to exist as cementite for long periods of time. And um, but truly, if you allow it to transform, it will transform into graphite and ferrite. And as I pointed out, various defects are tolerated in the product obtained. These defects are like dislocations, excess vacancies, internal interfaces. Uh, which include interface boundaries and green boundaries. <coughs>
Another important point which we will we have to note here and I will emphasize it again when we actually do, do uh, this operation is often cooling lines paths are overlaid on phase diagrams. Now, whenever I am talking about an equilibrium phase diagram, I automatically imply that time is not a variable. Given a certain composition, a certain temperature, a certain pressure, I would expect that a certain combination of phases in a very prescribed fraction should form. And however long I wait, these fractions should remain unaltered. That means, I know what are the phases which are going to coexist at a given temperature, pressure and composition and that combination is not going to be altered even if I wait for a long period of time. And therefore, in a typical phase diagram which does not involve time, there is no scope of introducing cooling curves. As I pointed out, though we have these phase diagrams involving time which are called the TTT diagrams or the CT diagrams, they will not form a part of this chapter and therefore, safely for now, we will talk about those diagrams which do not involve time and overlaying any cooling curves on these diagrams is technically not a correct thing to do. Strictly speaking, this should not be done, but this is done to actually improve the utility of the phase diagram. And when this is done, it is implied that the cooling rate is very slow. So, therefore, whenever we overlay cooling lines on a phase diagram and uh, this is an additional dimension to the phase diagram of time, this adds an additional dimension to the phase diagram and the interpretation has to be very carefully done that this cooling rate is assumed to be very slow and at least the system is in uh, some kind of a equilibrium during the entire process. Uh, sometimes very rarely even fast cooling paths are overlaid on phase diagrams and uh, uh, caution uh, uh, should be uh, exercised when you are doing this, because then uh, the interpretations of the original phase diagram are not, no longer any uh, no longer valid, where time plays no role. So, to emphasize this last point again, uh, whenever you are overlaying cooling lines or cooling paths on phase diagrams, it is expected to uh, or it is understood that the cooling rate is very slow. It is understood that you are actually extending the utility of the phase diagram beyond its very strict usage sense and the system is assumed to be in equilibrium during this entire cooling process. Next, we come to an important point which is known as the Gibbs phase rule in the context of phase diagrams. The phase rule which is also called the Gibbs phase rule connects degrees of freedom, the number of components in a system and the number of phases present in a system via a simple equation. To understand the phase rule, one must understand the variables in the system along with the degrees of freedom. So, in this context, the degrees of freedom is a technical term and we will try to understand what does this imply in the context of a phase diagram. In general, suppose uh, we are not particularly talking about phase diagrams, the general definition of degrees of freedom is 